It's an honor to be part of Slow Wine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, um, as a business, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to go into the first set of questions here, as a business, how has how have you been dealing with uh, these last six months under COVID? Um, well, the, my major part of my business is being a farmer, and the grapes really don't give a hoot about COVID. So <laughs> they have actually two of their own viruses we worry about, leaf roll and red blotch, uh, which we so far don't have. So they just, <laughs> um, they're just like, what do you, you got to be here. So I spent, I, the old concept of self-isolation is just basically a way of life for me, uh, running the vineyard. Um, that's on the growing side. So, and it's been a really good spring it, uh, from a farming side, uh, as far as heat and water and all. Uh, plants look really healthy. On the other side of now, I also have to sell my wine. And the things that have changed that is um, the way I've adapted. Now, the, so far, I'm actually on equal, uh, I'm dead on from last year as far as what, how much I've sold, but it's been a different market. Um, obviously, in this area where we are, or we're in Southern Oregon, Ashland restaurants, things are a big thing and they're just not getting the traffic. Um, we're not getting visitors, it's a tourist town. So my restaurant business is kind of been going has gone down but luckily that wasn't a huge part of my business what became better at least for a while for now has been direct sales I offered when this all happened a lot of people don't want to go out and they still don't want to go out and uh, I offered uh, free local delivery within the Rogue Valley for six bottles or more and people really took advantage of that the con convenience of that and I'm not the only one that's done that um, because up until recently, even people had big tasting rooms, they couldn't be open for tasting uh, until, until just recently. And the traffic is still not there. Um, so the free local delivery, my wine club people really took advantage of it. People are on the email list, took advantage of it. So it actually, we were ahead quite a bit of last year um, up until about a month ago. And then that's kind of quieted down because I think that now people are kind of thinking, how long is this going to go on? And do I have money for something like wine? So it's I, I've, I'm a little uneasy about the next stage about where the sales are going to come um, but in the initial thing was uh, it didn't hurt us at all in fact our business went up as far as selling wine okay great yeah. and and you mentioned too that you've been doing some virtual tastings can you tell me how that pro progressed and what the yeah it was fun so the so uh, we have the vineyard where the wine grower is I work with a winemaker up in the Willamette Valley named John Groshaw um, and he <clears throat> In his time, same trying to make use of his time, decided to start doing a series of virtual tastings with people he's worked with in the industry for a long time called John and Friends. And so uh, every Saturday night for about two months, he invited people he's known in the industry and we sat down, we, we sent wine back and forth and, and he had my bottles here there and I had his bottles here and uh, we would go through them. And, and John, John and I have worked together since 2005 when he used to buy all our grapes. So we have this long history. We've traveled to Spain together. So we had this hour-long discussion and people could sign up and listen to it. And some people actually got a hold of the wine themselves and did a, you know, tasted along with us. Um, it was fun, actually. I, um, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but as the discussion went along, we just, he would ask, how did you get in the industry? It was kind of like an interview like this is, but for uh, friends of his that have been in the industry for a while. Nice. It was fun. Yeah, nice. and we're looking, I'm going to do a couple, one more coming up with just a more private one of Spanish varietals. Uh-huh. You know, people can still, you know, we are now able to taste on the patio and all, but it, it's not the same. And, and and so we're still, I think this is going to go on for a while um, until whenever things settle down, um, this virtual stuff. And I think it's, I, I think this gonna, thing's going to last out of all this. I think the local delivery is going to last. I think that's, that was a, like a push that's people do appreciate that whether they can get out or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of this, this virtual uh, tasting seems like it's really taken off and I don't see why that would go away. Okay, great. So it's created some opportunities for you as well as some yep. challenges. Yeah. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Great. Okay, great. And I love your comment about the vines are dealing with their own viruses. <laughs> they don't care anything about if I'm sick or not. <laughs> 
That's <laughs> whether it be from a virus <laughs> or anything else. <laughs> okay, and and you haven't required masks on the vines themselves yet, huh? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we do the 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 change up there also as we since we went into phase two and we could do we can do tastings on our tasting patio. We always always have done it by by uh, by appointment anyway. Uh -huh. um, and we had uh, now by state edict. I if I'm serving wine, I wear a mask all the time. People sit at their tables. The tables are six to eight feet apart. They supposed to put a mask on if they're moving around, but they basically it's seated tastings. We're doing flights instead of single pours, and I bring back go back and forth, back and forth. We do flights, so I can only have to visit the table twice and do the. Right. Um, but we it's actually been a little bit busier than I thought. Not out of towners, it's been a lot of locals that want to get out. Uh, uh -huh. So we've yeah. had a couple of busy weekends. Yeah, people yeah. are tired of being inside. So that's I been think. good. Yeah. They are. Okay. They are. Great. And as you can see on, on your green screen behind you, that's it's a pretty nice view from the patio. It's a gorgeous view. It's a gorgeous setting on top of that rise there, looking over the valley, out over to Roxy Ann. And I think that's uh, McLaughlin out there, isn't it? Mount Pitt? It would have to be way farther. Um, I'm not sure you can see McLaughlin from, from there. Maybe you can. Way, way uh, out there. Could be. Yeah, if it's still got a little white on it, maybe. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. no, we, it's a fun place. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you. So um, tell us how you got started and, and tell us um, who about you and Molly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the business uh, Upper Five Vineyard, uh, the more brief, the recent history was that um, Molly Morrison and myself uh, founded Upper Five. We bought this piece of property in 2000, didn't have grapes on it. It was a form of pear orchard um, and most of the pear trees, except for the few you see in the background, they're from the original orchard. They're about 50 or 60 years old. Um, and we bought it in 2000 and sat on it for a few years. Uh, in 2000, there wasn't a lot of, as many vineyards, if very few vineyards in the Rogue Valley. And it, and in most estimation, it wasn't clear it was going to be a pre premier wine region, meaning high-end wines that on our scale, we had to have for the few grapes we were selling, we had to make sure they were very good to make it a profitable business. Upper five, uh, it's the... Uh, uh, in the old days, uh, up until about 75, as most in the Rogue Valley, there were a lot of pear orchards, and, and where Upper Five sits was part of a much bigger pear orchard called the Old Bagley Pear Orchard. Um, in 75, they divided that big orchard into a bunch of different properties, including where Upper Five sits. But in the old days, Upper Five, that was considered the Upper Five acres of the Old Bagley Orchard. So when people say, go work on the Upper Five uh, Pear Orchard, that's where the vineyard sits now. So we just retained that agricultural history name to it. Nice. Um, yeah, we had other names, but I don't want it named after me. I don't want it named after, I love my dog, but I think it just retaining the agricultural <laughs> history is an important part of it. <laughs> so, and, and it sounds better than the lower two and all, it's all sorts of marketing, high five, all that other stuff, but, um, but it does have a history to it. And so and, yeah, back to when Molly and I bought it in 2000, we weren't sure we we're gonna put in grapes we wanted to, but um, the, the wine and, uh, was not great coming out of the valley in 2000. Nothing to do with anybody, but there wasn't a lot of experience uh, growing grapes in the area. There were a few that have been around, uh, but now, now, as everyone knows, it's it's becoming a, a fairly well-known wine region. Certainly, a lot more grapes, and we have a lot of expertise of coming to the valley in the last five to ten years. But we so we didn't know. So, but we spent three years trying to learn, um, mostly taking these courses at UC Davis, uh, epicenter for enology and viticulture in the US. Um, and they offered you know, weekend courses for idiots like me that want to plant grapes on a small piece of property. And some from the best professors telling you how to irrigate a vineyard, how to choose a variety. There would be two day courses for $150 in Davis. Um, and so we did a lot of those and did a lot of our own research, talked to some of our neighbors. I talked to a lot of people actually in California because they had a little more experience about grapes and we had a closer and we have a close enough climate to many places in California. And anyway, after three years, it was clear to us that if we did a good job, we could potentially have a really good site. Uh, and, and, uh, and then it was after that, it was like, learn your site. And so um, we did the best we could starting it out. And then uh, in 2000, so 2003, we planted uh, the, uh, two thirds of it. Uh, in Savignon Blanc, Tempranillo, and Syrah, with a couple of spatterings of Rogue Valley mischief, like a row of Dolcetto, a row of 
Viognier, a row of Vermentino, just to see which those got quickly grafted over to, you know, to the varieties that we found were really good on site. And in 2005, we had our first harvest. Um, we just wanted to farm. We didn't want to make wine. Um, and we had a, a, the guy who was actually now our winemaker, John Groshaw, he bought all our grapes from 2005 through 2009 to make his wines. So he had a Sauvignon Blanc on our Groshaw cellars, a Syrah on our Groshaw cellars, a Tempranillo on Groshaw cellars. Then we had one more acre that we hadn't planted in 2006, and we were kind of figuring out what should we put in, and John was the one that suggested we put in Grange, uh, which now I think is the best grape for my site, mm -hmm. but um, uh, no one was, was planting that, but he, it, was, it, was, it was great. I, it, I'll be tasting a Grenache here, and I, I've actually grafted a bunch of stuff now over to Grenache, which is now my biggest planting. Nice. So that was 2006. Then in 2010, it was the beginning of the recessiony times and uh, wineries kind of were scaling back. And so um, we just, uh, we kept the, some of our grapes. It wasn't hard to sell them, but we figured they were not sure they were gonna do something with them. So we, we kept a little bit of turn Tempranillo to start the upper five label, just 1.3 tons. I made 75 cases. We were still selling the other grapes to other wineries. Um, that 2010 Tempranillo got a 90 points from the Wine Spectator as a, for 75 cases. Um, it's been downhill ever since. No, just kidding. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was surprising and fun at the same time. And then, uh, and then, it, so we kept selling the other grapes. And then in 2013, we kept the Sauvignon Blanc. And then in 2014, we were still selling grapes, but the wine buyer emailed me in the middle of August that I can't buy your grapes. Good luck. And that's right, like two weeks before harvest. Mm. So we ended up, it's okay, we were gonna do this anyway. We had already made the decision to keep all the grapes for the upper five label and just not sell grapes anymore, yeah. just keep it for, so in 14 was when we kept all of the grapes to start, uh, just make all, all our own wine, stop selling grapes to other people. So essentially you, you uh, took your time developing your brand and developing your market, which is a very right. smart thing. Yeah, it was part of its economics, part of it is, we, I, I kid John about it because he played with our grapes for five years and other winemakers did. I said, I wanted you to make the mistakes on how, how to make my wine. And now <laughs> I'm keeping them. <laughs> I, I kid with them. But uh, it's, uh, but yeah, it was, it, I, we're, we didn't, as supposed to admit, many people in the industry, I didn't, we didn't come in with a few million. It's like, we can afford to crush 1.3 tons of Tempranillo this year to make our own label okay, let's save some more money. Now we can afford to crush three tons of Sauvignon Blanc in 2013. And also just seeing how the market responded because I didn't know how to sell wine. I'm not a salesman <laughs> and we weren't big enough to, you know, hire a salesman. So it was nice to just have 75 cases to sell that first time and just see the reaction in the market, especially being organic. We were, cer oh, we were certified organic, our vineyard certified organic in 2005. It's the first certified organic vineyard in Southern Oregon. Um, and we kept that certification and quite honestly, I, we didn't know how that was going to be received uh, because there's Back up. Both what, why did you choose to go uh, organic in the first place? Yeah, actually, that's even the bigger story. When we were deciding to plant grapes, we weren't, our primary thing was whatever we farmed there was going to be farming or organically. Um, so if we, if, so with the, part of that three years of research or yeah, three was to say, can you farm wine grapes organically and still make good wine because you would hear both sides of that story you know that's the wine that fell off the back of the truck and you know uh, organic still had that kind of and it's still in some people's thinks that think that that's the case too um so it took those three years to also meet organic grape growers down mostly mostly in, well, in california there was none in our region there's some up in the willamette northern oregon but they have a different climate i needed to know what challenges might be in our climate to, to farm in organic diseases and pests like that. So, but why was, organic? Uh, why oh, organic? Oh, 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 easy. It's 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 better for the land. There it's better you go. for me. It's better for my dog. It's better for my neighbors. There you it's go. better for the world. Okay. <laughs> in my humble opinion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel much more co uh, comfortable offering my product to other people when I know what ha happened in the uh, what happened to those grapes that made themselves into wine. And so I also have much. Does that philosophy extend to other aspects of your life? I mean, I talk to some people and organic is like a checklist. It's a brand differentiator. Yeah, so what do you mean other aspects of my life? What do you mean? 
do you live organically? Do you live in oh, yeah. a sustainable I manner? Pretty much I mean, how how does that philosophy extend? Yeah, yeah. I I uh, I shopping for food. I I unless there are chances that I can't always buy organic products, but I do. Um, and it's not just because I want to support the industry, which is a big part of it. It is I really don't want to be tasting or not tasting having Roundup in my meal or herbicides or pesticides that it, you can make your own judgments but that's when that's what stuff's been deemed that potentially can ha harm you and uh so I, I try to lead a pretty clean life that way um i certainly do the same thing with, 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 i spend a lot of time outdoors um I, honestly one of what people come and ask what are the wines do you drink uh, Pat, i know and i said i'll tell you what i'm this is nothing against any wines and all but if they're not farmer organically, I'm not sure I really want to drink their wine. It's just, uh, I don't want to put that in my body. And uh, I also don't want to encourage it. You know, there's a uh, part, part of the whole organic thing is some people say, well, is it better wine or does it taste better? I said, you know, that's, that's not the big part of the story. The story is someone is taking care of their land this way. And uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cascade of people taking care of things that make something into a product that's, Call, that can be certified organic. Like if I buy seed for my property, if I buy cover crop seed, that cover crop seed has to be certified organic. That means someone growing seed somewhere has to be farming organically. So that responsibility now goes down to him. And if he buys fertilizer for his organic seed farm, that fertilizer has to be certified organic. It's, it's this bigger, bigger chain. It's not so much um, what, uh, if it tastes good or, or you feel better about it. You're really, you're really branching out in your responsibility to what, what people are doing on their property in the world. That's like, it's a much bigger picture than, when I get the chance, I get on the soapbox, but a lot of times people kind of glaze over when I go that way. No, thank, thank you for going through that. I think that's an important aspect of your vineyard. Um, I think that your background also leads you to some of this. Don't you have a background in? Um, I, uh, my, my other job, which pays much better than wine, is I'm a consulting oceanographer. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in nature on boats. Um, also, uh, my business partner, Molly, she's a botanist. Um, and she works for the Nature Conservancy. So there's kind of a philosophy, you know, it's, it's even, you know, we wouldn't have, we have a big vegetable garden up in the vineyard and to certify everything up there organic, we could do what we ever wanted in the vegetable farm garden, but we still maintain to get only certified organic seeds. I mean, only only certified organic fertilizers. So it is. It, it's it. It's definitely how I've tried to lead my life. You know, um, low impact uh, uh, car that uses very little fuel. <laughs> I mean, it, every, I I think about every part of how my impact uh, is on my farm, my world, my neighbors. Um, Thank you. Sense. Thank you very much. Um, Another uh, question or idea, have you made any changes over the last year in how you've handled or farmed your property? The biggest one, as I mentioned earlier, is going to no-till um, yeah. and not disturbing the land. There's been too many conferences I've gone to in the last two years of that the soil, if, if there's not a competition issue, that there's a much better, there's an interaction that's going on deep in the soil that when you start tilling things in and obviously using herbicides, those relationships can be, be destroyed or go away. And that's very important for the, that life cycle that's in your soil. Okay, okay, great. So you're, you're moving from, um, from a, a tractor going through? Yep. And so we, yeah, yeah. That, how you've made that change and why. You, yeah, you that, that's- less that, impact that, on the land. And exactly, less tackle. impact. As, and I, I'm a boy, I love my tractor, but it really does, it's heavy and it's a very necessary part of my farm. Um, but every time I, everything I can do to keep that off the property, off the land, um, is much better for the soil and the plants around it. Okay, great. Have you had to make any changes in irrigation? I know last year and this year we've had more rain than usual. Um, well, we're slowly, we can't do it on the entire property, but the, in fact, the Grenache we're, we're gonna taste, um, we've been able to dry farm one block Okay. for the last since 2017 okay. it's our my deepest soil um the grenache it's it, it's my part of my grenache and grenache is known to be very drought tolerant um and so um i i'm i'm 
when we have a good winter year, uh, winter year. Now we had a lot of wet, wetness this spring, but that really didn't wasn't in the time to fill up the snowpack and fill up the right. reservoirs. So that's kind of surface stuff, but it's helped a little bit. So this one's I, I'm looking now. I can look at the plants now and see. Am I going to have to put a little water on them? Not yet but I am a little worried. But I, I was hoping when we have better winter years, I want to extend that block farther and farther. I can't do the whole place dry farming um, because I just don't have enough soil. Uh, and the physics just aren't, isn't there. The top of my ridge is only about two and a half feet of soil over solid rock. And they're just, we don't get enough rain to fill up that soil. It's not deep enough to hold enough water to feed those plants. Right, right. But do you have any that, building I, ponds or anything like that? We have one holding pond, but because of that solid rock uh, underneath it, when we, it, it's an irrigation pond we had to, when we first uh, bought the place, we wanted it about four feet deeper. And the guy went in with a bulldozer and he started hitting that solid rock. So now it's just kind of a habitat pond. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> we, we put a lot of native plants around it and it's kind of one of our, uh, you know, uh, it's part of biodynamic farming, which is that next step, which I don't know, that's where it's certified. You're supposed to leave part of your property 10 to 15 percent wild or not cultivated. And places, places where native plants or flowers can be there and animals. So that little pond that's over on the east side, that it fills up usually in the and it has a lot of plants on it. So that's kind of our habitat pond now, but all it's right. not useful for anything else really as far as irrigation. All but we're, all, we're also all, all in drip irrigation, so we, we're, it's a fairly conservative process. So the next um, area, let's kind of segue into your winemaking. And I know you're working with uh, John to make your right. wine, but you're very involved. Yes. Um, can you talk about the interaction between you and John, between the mm -hmm. winemaker and the grape growing, and yep. how your wine expresses that, um, that collaboration? The, well, the beauty of working with John, one of the reasons we went back to him after making our wine in a couple other places is because he uh, he doesn't own his own vineyard. He makes a lot of wine, but he really believes that the uh, wine is made in the vineyard. And if the grapes come in, in in okay shape and not having disease issues, he's just going to guide him down the process. Uh, keep it safe. He's like, yeah, don't screw it up. And that's what we really want to do uh, is to express the sight in these wines. Um, and a couple things that you, that are uh, are ways to do that. So with John, uh, our interaction, in fact, he's coming down next weekend. We're very good friends. We travel together. Um, when it comes to winemaking, I really respect his, he's been doing it for more than a couple of decades, mostly up in the North, but he's seen everything as far as grapes, what can happen in a winery. Um, so um, if, I, if there's some something I want to do with the wines, uh, create a little different style i say well, how can we do that in the vineyard and what, what do the grapes need to be to be like that so he, he his experience can help me do that so that we can still maintain that concept that we're doing it in the vineyard with our farming practices and how we let's say how we shoot thin or how we drop fruit or when we pick um he doesn't want to be in there and i'm not he's not going to add chemicals and over process the grapes our, our, our wines are typically considered more pretty than powerful and more balanced. And the concept is that that's all about when you pick and how, how you grow and then just make sure it gets through fermentation safely. So well, like when it comes time to pick, um, we've had a number of years experience of when to pick each grape. Primarily, uh, I make the decision about when to pick. Um, and he just said, okay, I, let me know when they're coming in. And then the other other part is okay. What's going to happen in the winery? So so say for the red wines, um, what do we want to do about barrels? So we pretty much now use very little new oak. Um, again, it's about it's about expressing the site and the fruit. The vineyard's old enough now that the fruit is getting pretty complex, and I just don't want to over over oak it because um, that's not what I want to taste in my wine. It's a little different style than many people do around here, and people recognize that, particularly in the Tempranillo, that it's not that big bomb over American oak type of, uh, of wine, and none of ours are considered that way. So what John is, uh, I'll, I'll tell him, this is what, you know, like, let's say, the grapes are coming in, what kind of barrels do you want to use? Well, I don't want to use any barrels. Okay, he's fine with that. And, and, he, and he said, this is what's probably gonna happen. And I said, okay, that's fine with me. And I said, what? So it, it, it's a constant co collaboration where he lets us 
make the decisions for our style. And then, but if we think, if we off, ask to do something, he said, that's not what you want to do. He uh -huh. has the expression. So we really feel it's, it's a complete teamwork, but we feel that definitely there are wines um, uh -huh. because, well, because of, they reflect what we really want to do. And, and we want, my big thing is I want somewhere down the road, someone to pick up a bottle of my wine and as they do in parts of Europe and say, that's a wine from the Rogue Valley, that's from Upper Five, just by taste. Mm -hmm. And it may, maybe vintage is different, but they'll notice that there's some, not stylistic, but element to it that says they can, they can place that at a place. And that's, I think, should be the biggest goal for most people growing grapes. Uh -huh. is to make that style if it's if it's a good site uh you want you want that to reflect itself in the bottle have you have you had any challenges because you're you're so distant it's a good what four hours four hours away yeah it's uh when i transport the grapes in my flatbed truck it's about four and a half hours that's the challenge for me because usually like on a harvest day we'll be i'll be up before daybreak right and we have to get the grapes up there at least the white right. grapes we have to get them up there in the afternoon so if we're picking you know i start at daybreak and i've been up for two hours then <laughs> then i'm getting on the truck we're, we're finished picking by about noon time yeah i the, the truck is is a beast on the highway and so i'm pretty knackered by the time i get there but usually i just pull into the winery i go find some place and just lay down and sleep but that's the only challenge and is is during harvest just going back and forth okay it, with as you as even with zoom and or anything else there's a, communication is not an issue when you want to actually talk to somebody. Uh -huh. um, but, but as far as actually, and what, but once they're up there, it's fine. Uh, that, that, that's the most challenging part for me. There's a lot okay. of time on the highway during September and October. Yeah, I, I guess it really does add another element of, of effort in a very compressed time frame. Yep. Um, yeah. That must. It's, mostly, it's not so bad, uh, like when we get to the red pick, which is the later picks, it's not a, such a big deal. Uh, because they it's cool it's cooled down a little bit um the skins are thicker they're not going to get damaged and, and processed but right. when we pick the Sauvignon Blanc at the end of August beginning of September it can still be hot so we do things like we put a blocks of dry ice in each picking bin so uh -huh. on the transport up there it's displacing oxygen it's keeping it cooler um we haven't seen any what we think are adverse effects to that, that sure. arrangement. sure during during the um I don't know if you consider your your wines aged or or how you're handling the wines that you'll present today, but do you take the time to go up and see the wine during its all, processing all period, the, look at blending and and do all the time? Yeah. yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, it's not just John making the wine. It's no, no, no. Um, you know, in particular, uh, well. We're friends, so we go. I go up and visit, and uh, and I, I have a distributor up in Portland that distributes my wine. So I'll be up there visiting. And I'll make sure I stop by the winery. We will taste through the barrels and see how they're doing. Um, and then, particularly when we come around to the Reds, we will sit down. I'll go up there twice a year before bottling, and we'll go through all the barrels and decide. Like we we make one blend or or Grenache Syrah Tempranillo. We'll go through and taste all the red barrels. What's going to be Syrah? What's going to be Tempranillo? What's going to be Oso Grande, which is the, the blend. Uh -huh. And so, and that we, I would say I am up there three to four times a year, tasting, uh -huh. barrel tasting for one. I go up there twice a year because he has an open house and he allows us to pour. So we always take that at Thanksgiving and Memorial Day as an opportunity to, to, to go taste through all the barrels. Um, so, and it's, it's an easy drive for me and I like visiting Portland. So if yeah. I feel like I want to taste the barrels, I'll, I'll, I'll just drive up. And you're not driving um, the truck. No, no, I have a nice, comfortable Volkswagen Jetta. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Thank and yeah, you. as I said, I do. I, we used to live up there, and I do like the area, so I, it's not a problem. No, I we're very active, and in, in, I mean, he's a daily basis, but um, I lo I love seeing the progression in the barrels and making some decisions for that. At that point, it's really a collaborative decision because he can notice flavors and tastes in a barrel that maybe I haven't had enough experience to know, well, that means this is what it's going to turn into. Maybe we need to bottle it earlier, maybe right. even in barrel longer, things like right. that. Um, you've alluded to a couple of the qualities that you want your wines to have. You, you want your wines to be drinkable, <laughs> not overwhelming. You want your wines right. to be, um, to, to be widely, widely enjoyed, not with a niche. Um, right, right. Can you kind of um, 
expound on that a little bit more? Sure. Are they made for early drinking or what are, what are you looking for there? There, we, yeah, there's the, well, the, the primary thing is that I believe food and wine is one word. And so, um, if you, so for me, a good wine, wine that goes with food is one that is a more balanced wine. It's not just one big bunch of fruit right in your mouth. Um, it, it's, it's basically that wine's going to be in your mouth the same time as your food. So I want it to complement it, which typically for me means wines, are, my wines are probably going to have a little bit more acid, um, uh, and not considered flabby wines. They're going to be more, um, so it, what that translates to in the farming part of it is that we typically pick our grapes a little earlier than most people do. Um, the longer you let something hang, the more sugar it gets, the, more, the less acid it gets. We'd rather have not such a big wine, have one that has a much more structure to it. And that tends to be much better with food. The tannins are a little more present. Okay, great. Whether it be young or, young or old, um, that's up to anybody else. I tend to release my wines. We, we make about 650, 700 cases a year across all of our wines. And normally none last more than a year since they've been released, which is nice. So I'm ready for the next vintage. Um, and so sometimes it lasts a lot less than a year, like my rosés and rosado and even my Grenache and my uh, particularly Grenache. They could definitely benefit for aging, but here's the economics. I'm not, I don't own a Spanish bodega that's been in five generations of family. So if, the, if, if I'm out of a 17 vintage and the 18 is what we can try today, if, as long as it's not bad, it's young. Like someone once said, young doesn't mean bad, it's a young good wine or an old good wine. It's, it's a good wine and it's, it's gonna change. And I always tell people like, if you want me to sit on this for another couple of years, it is not gonna be $26. If you wanna hold on to it, Mm -hmm. that's fine and but i what i typically do when it's kind of one of those places where maybe it's a little early to release this next vintage because the other one's gone i'll take a bottle around to some of my best customers uh meaning stores or restaurateurs and say is this is this portable for you because i'm tasting more on a technical level i just know that there's no flaws but is this presentable to your your clientele and if they say, if they ever said no, which they haven't, I would probably hold it back. Mm -hmm. But they will say, no, that's great. You know, we'll just, we'll open it up a little earlier. I'll breathe a little bit. And nice. everyone knows it's a young wine. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect segue to um, move into your wines now. And if you could sure. show us the three wines that you're presenting, it would be great. Yeah. So the first one is a uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Can show, can you see it? Uh -huh. Okay, it's a 2018 Sauvignon Blanc, but it's one particular one we do. Uh, we call it acacia because it actually spends four to five months in an acacia barrel, European acacia, which is a black locust tree in the US. Uh, it's not uncommon in France to use acacia to make barrels. Um, and uh, so we started doing this in 2016. Um, we were, we were do, a long time ago, we were do, making wine just in neutral oak barrels, the Sauvignon Blanc. Didn't care for that so much, but then we're just doing it stainless to be really fresh. And then we said, we need a little more body to it. So John, I was going to back with John, he's, I said, we're not that, not that keen on neutral oak. It just, it can be all over the place in a barrel. So, so how, how about trying acacia? It's, most, it's not gonna give you an oak flavor, but it'll give that barrel effect. It'll be around, it'll add some roundness to it. And it's supposed to really pull out these different aspects of the fruit. Okay. So we, we make, make two Sauvignon Blancs. This one's the acacia, we also keep stuff that was done in stainless, we keep that as a separate bottling. But this one is the same juice that we put in an acacia barrel, a 500 liter punching for about four months before we bottle it. So it's a little, very short time frame. but uh, when you pour side by side, it's uh, distinctively different. So yeah, it's, uh, and, but it doesn't give it a woodiness to it. Um, it's still got the Sauvignon Blanc nose to it um, with, a caveat, not New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. We're a warm climate, and so it has a nose of Sauvignon Blanc that may be more discernible as a French Sauvignon Blanc, a Sancerre, maybe a Pouille Fumé, uh, Pouille Fumé. Um, so it's, it's a little more riper nose. I call it a key lime as opposed to a lemon lime, uh, just a little bit rounder. And then the barrel tends to, and it's very, the acid's there. Sauvignon Blanc is an acid grape. Um, but the nose is, starts to get this, I call it unctuousness. It's, it's almost like um, stone fruit starts coming in, into it. Peach, 
on the nose, a little rounder. This is an 18. So it's been in bottle for a year, almost a year and a half. Um, and it's still really, really fresh. And this is the one I've, I've more people than not have said, I didn't know that you could make French Sauvignon Blanc in, uh, in, the, in the new world. Because typically you get the real Kiwi style that's really zingy, grassy, or you get down to California where it's up in 14.5% alcohol and it's round, it's, it's okay, but it doesn't have that bright freshness to it. But um, partly one of the reasons we can get there with this is because our site is high elevation. We're almost 2000 foot, so we have a little cooler in most places. Plus, we, it's the first grape we pick. We pick this one not on sugar, we pick it on flavors. And um, so it's, it rarely comes in more than 12.5% alcohol. This one's, I think, around 12.5, uh, maybe a little more. And then, uh, like, the new version is 11.9. So it's a lower alcohol. But it's that first pick to create. I want to I know that there's fruit. I don't want it to be overwhelmed by any alcohol level at all. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then the two reds, so that's the 2018 Sauvignon Blanc Acacia. Um, we stay with the same year, 2018. This is the one that's relatively young. It's a Grenache, 100% Grenache. Okay. Uh, Grenache, I love Grenache. I didn't think I would, but I really love it. Um, and it's, uh, it took a while. Uh, it's in the, its early years when we first planted the first few vintages, it was a really pretty wine, which is typically what Grenache can be. Um, but in these last three vintages, since primarily since I've been dry farming, it started to gain some real structure and body to it. Um, oh, uh, so no, we don't add any yeast. It's all made of fermentation on all our wines. Um, this one spends about a year in new ferments a year in neutral oak um, and finishes the neutral oak we don't want oak on Grenache at all but the fruit is just so prevalent we also my understanding before we've made Grenache is Grenache tends to oxidize so the longer you leave it in barrel with that micro oxidation going on you start losing the fruit it starts losing the color so this is the one we all our other reds where it's 18 months in barrel, the Grenache goes 12 months at most in barrel before we bottle it. So this has actually only been, been, been in bottle since February, uh, which is really young for red, but my 17 sold out about four months ago. So we held on a little bit, um, uh, but it is, the fruit is so much, it's so much more concentrated. It's, it's, some people think it's really, really bright fruit, but then there's a cassis structure to it, uh, a structural, element to it to some spice almost someone said oh you must have had this on uh, barrels because it's very has some nice tannins no it's just all comes from the grape mm. and so the what we found from the from the uh, dry farming because the dry farm is here right next to it is Grenache it doesn't dry farm and when you do the samples the berry sizes on the dry farm stuff are about 10 percent smaller mm -hmm. so if you think on a berry there's juice skin seeds so with less juice there's more Ratio is a higher ratio of seeds and and skin and color on that, so it's going to concentrate that flavors more. And it's been very noticeable since sixteen was the first year we dry farm that that the flavor is much more concentrated. Nice. And number three, I picked the two thousand. This is two thousand sixteen Tempranillo, and it's kind of the reason I picked this one. I, I love all our wines. Um, but because Tempranillo has just been the one that we first bottled, and it's one most people know us from because it's been on the market the longest. When people come out and um, taste, they say, oh, I've had your Tempranillo. I want, you know, I want to try some more of it. Um, and, and one of the bigger parts of that is this is the one that we've had the most evolution in. We've been having on our bottling since 2010. I've actually had some that John used to make. But we've seen the evolution of what it's become. Uh, we, this one maybe has 10% new oak on it. Um, in the early years, we were buying, it was never a huge amount of oak. We were buying new barrels because you, <laughs> you feel you're an artist and you got to buy new barrels from France if you're making wine. And then you realize after about four years that the best wine was in the barrels that were old. And it was because the plant, in my mind, plants are getting older. The fruit is much more complex. You don't need to, you know, put lipstick on it. There's enough flavor in that fruit. 
It may not be a style that people recognize as Rioja, but it's what our, our site reflects. And this is all pure reflection of our site without doctoring it with American oak or French oak or any sort of manipulation. But, and it's funny, uh, yeah, this is really dark food. This is 2016, our present, present release. Um, when you're starting to get, well, Tempranillo will, will always have tannins. That's the nature of it. In fact, when you go to pick, you're always trying to make sure the tannins have softened because otherwise you, you'll, you'll have to put your wine away like the Spanish do and for 10 years or else uh, to be able to drink because the tannins are so heavy and they're so powerful. So if you get them nice and dry and dusty before you pick as, they, as the grapes mature, they'll still be there, which is really good for food. A little bit of tannins is really good for food and you'll retain some acid. But this, so the cherry, usually it's a dark cherry flavor that comes with this, a little bit of coffee, a little spice, um, and perfect pairings as they should be are things like chorizo and paella. And, uh, and I always wondered, did the cuisine come first or did the grape? In Spain, was it, <laughs> did they have pigs and chorizo and then they found this grape or did they have this grape or, or, and they found, or because it went so well together, they pulled out every other grape and kept the tempranillo. It really, it really matches Spanish cuisine really well. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. When, when it sometimes lends itself towards to a, uh, a thing my father used to take me out to this drugstore to have uh, cherry cokes. When they would, uh, instead of buying them in a can, you would have a Coca Cola out of the fountain. They'd pour some mar maraschino cherry juice in it and make a cherry cokes in the drugstore. That's this one always gets there. Me. Yeah. It's, it, I don't know if it's proper wine description cherry coke, but that, that's <laughs> that's what he, a little caramel, you know, the, the fruits there, a little bit of bite because it's Coca Cola. Your mm. use of the phrase cherry coke lends lends me to think of a mouthfeel as well. Yeah, but absolutely, it's kind of smooth. The caramel kind of flows over your over your tongue. Yes, very yeah. much so. And that comes with, with bottle age, you get more and more of that. That, that dark cherry, dark, uh, dark fruit starts coming more and more as it's in the bottle for a while. Well, um, Terry, I thank you so much for your time today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, bring out in this conversation that we haven't, we haven't um, talked uh, about? Um, no, I guess the biggest thing is, is the general philosophy of, uh, you know, because we are certified biodynamic and, and without the details in that are for a few of us. But the biggest thing is that it creates that type of farming. We try to reflect it in the wine as a balance. Um, everything works with each other and uh, we like to make a balanced wine. We think we want the vineyard to be balanced between good in, quote, the good insects and bad insects. We want the... Uh, um, I, I like the philosophy of me doing less work and letting the plants figure it out. So that when I'm doing stuff, it's, uh, it's always uh, to trying to make property more balanced so that it can take care of itself. And uh, I hope that that actually reflects into balanced wines too. Yeah.